Um, Dr. Holt received her bachelor's degree in equine sciences from the University of Bristol in 2002. Following, she completed her PhD in biological sciences, also in the UK at the University of Leeds. Dr. Holt then completed two postdoc positions, one at Harvard University and one at UC Irvine. From 2017 to 2019, she was an assistant professor at Northern Arizona University. And now she is currently an assistant professor at UC Riverside in the Department of Evolution, Ecology, and Organismal Biology. Her research expertise ranges from skeletal muscle physiology to the mechanics and energetics of leaf cutter ants, to tonic fibers, and to muscle thermal performance. Some fun facts about Natalie. While she enjoys living in a communal house with eight other adults, she really hopes that in the future she can have chickens again. Also, she teaches a class on the social and scientific problems of race and gender as biological categories. As a reminder, I will first turn it over to Dr. Holt for her presentation, and then we will have a question and answer period to follow. And at that time, I'll remind everyone how to ask a question. So with that, Natalie, you're welcome to start sharing your screen and you can begin whenever you're ready. Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, so today I'd like to talk a lot about the force length relationship in striated muscle. And I want to really talk about two different facets of my work on this, some kind of historical work looking at um, really the persistence or lack thereof this relationship under dynamic conditions relevant to movement, and then some more comparative aspects from some newer work that's just getting started in my lab. So, don't have screen advance, that's not ideal. Okay, um, so I'm gonna talk about work done in my lab, also past work with my grad student, Brian Hamilton, uh, previous advisor, Manny Azizi, my current postdoc, uh, Nihav Davale, and my collaborator, David Labontis. These people are all co-authors on this work. So let's start by thinking about striated muscle. And I always, like the reason I love muscle is it's really this interface between organisms and their environment. So we think about striated muscle acting as the biological motor and powering walking, swimming, flying, jumping, involved in food processing and breathing and sound production. So it really mediates a lot of organisms and uh, interactions with their environment. And it does this through the interactions between the contractile proteins, actin and myosin. And we have these actin and myosin monomers organized into these thin purple actin filaments and thick green myosin filaments and these organized into sarcomeres this kind of functional unit of muscle and it's this organization of these contractile proteins that gives us the striated nature of muscle that we see under microscopy and so my work historically has mostly been on vertebrate muscle i've recently become interested in invertebrate muscle who use a remarkably similar muscle structure to again, walk, fly, process food, fight, keep their shells closed in the case of the bivalves. So again, this whole range of functional abilities with this very similar tissue. And so just a little bit of background because we'll come back to a bunch of these aspects. If we think about the process of contraction by skeletal muscle, let me see if I can just change my pointer for a second. There we go. Uh, if we think about this process of contraction by skeletal muscle, we have a motor neuron interacting with a muscle fiber. We release neurotransmitter. This depolarizes the muscle cell membrane. We get release of calcium. This triggers the process of cross bridge cycling. So we uh, interactions between actin and myosin are permitted in the presence of calcium. We get this conformational change of the myosin head. This is our force generating work producing step. And we then hydrolyze ATP and reset this whole cycle. So we have this basic mechanism of muscle contraction driving all of these movements. And one of the consequences of using this basic mechanism of muscle contraction, so this interaction, these cross bridge interactions between actin and myosin, that act to kind of slide the actin thin filaments past the myosin thick filaments. As a consequence of this, we have this relationship between the length of the sarcomere 
and the amount of force that a muscle can produce. So if I hold a muscle fiber or a single sarcomere at a constant length and I activate it, I will get a given amount of force. If I passively stretch that muscle to a longer length and again activate it at a constant length isometrically, I'll get less force out. If I shorten that muscle passively to a shorter length, again, I'll get less force out. So we can characterize this isometric constant length relationship between force and length. And this, the, the kind of discovery of this relationship was really fundamental in shoring up our theories of muscle contraction because the presence of this relationship really supports the idea of these contractile proteins that are sliding past one another and having varying scope for interaction. This is kind of fundamental in development of the cross bridge and sliding filament theories of muscle contraction. And I want to just think a little bit about the, the mechanistic basis of this force length relationship and what kind of what gives us these transition points and what happens when we're producing zero force in a muscle. And I would actually love some help on this. So if anyone has more nuanced thoughts than me, I would love to discuss them at the end. Um, but if we think about the relationship between actin and myosin at different lengths, we can start to characterize this relationship. And a bunch of people have described this in slightly different ways, attributing slightly different aspects of uh, structure to these, these different points. But if we start kind of with the easy one, at this point here where muscle's producing its highest force, we can think of this as corresponding to our thin actin filaments almost touching and having maximum possible scope to interact with these myosin filaments via cross bridges. That's a relatively safe premise, I feel like. If we stretch the sarcomeres or the muscle fiber a little longer, we can go a given distance without seeing any drop of force. And that's because myosin has this bare region in the center where there's no cross bridges protruding. So we're not losing any cross bridge potential by stretching our sarcomeres a little longer. Still feels like fairly safe territory to me. If we stretch our sarcomeres out even longer, we get to some point where actin and myosin no longer overlap, so there's no potential for force generation, and we hit zero force somewhere around a sarcomere length of the length of myosin plus two lengths of actin and some extra bit. Um, and I feel pretty good about the mechanisms of the decline in force production based on the sliding filament theory here. If we go the other way down the force length relationship, so force dropping off at these shorter lengths, if we think about going from three to two on our figure here, I feel like to me this is the least clear section of force decline. My best guess is that actin and the actin, opposite actin filaments start to slide past one another and they're creating some obstruction in this zone here, but the obstruction is not complete. Maybe it's just changing the number of cross bridges that combined. And so we have this shallow slope. And then as we move down towards zero force, at some length, we reach a sarcomere length shorter than myosin. So we start to get compression of myosin and presumably incorrect or non-existent cross bridge binding to zero force. But I personally find this whole side of the force length relationship mechanistically like a little shaky. So if anyone has thoughts on that, I'd love to hear them later. So we have this theory of muscle contraction. It gives us a force length relationship and this, force length relationship that we can think of as being a consequence of using overlapping contractile proteins to generate force and do work has some pretty major in vivo implications. It means that as I move my knee through some range of joint motion, I change the length of the muscle, so I stretch or shorten it, and I change the length of the sarcomere, so I change their force generating capacity. So presumably we want muscles operating over a reasonably favorable high force range of this force length relationship during everyday activity. We've also kind of thought about this force length relationship as really shaping organismal morphology over evolutionary time. So Alexander way back in the 60s suggested that the really complicated arrangement of muscle fibers in fish was to allow for similar strains in different muscle fibers. So if you imagine a fish being something that bends its body one way and another, you obviously have much larger strains in some regions than others. This isn't ideal for something that is a length dependent motor. And so we have this complex arrangement. 
We think about something like frog jumping, which has a very large requirement for muscle length change in order to do work. And we think about the region of the force length relationship over which muscle might operate. So the paper violets of Rome kind of mapped in vivo operating lengths in these circles onto a force length relationship and showed that even while doing a relatively large length change and producing significant work, frogs use fairly optimal length. So we sort of think about this basic relationship from the fundamental properties of muscle as kind of shaping organismal design over time. This happens dynamically as well. So it's old paper from the 70s looking at uh, mice hind limbs that were either immobilized in a stretch position or immobilized in a shortening position. We see the number of sarcomeres in their muscle fibers change so that they're still operating around favorable lengths in these stretched or shortened limb configurations. So we really think of this force length relationship as something that shapes organismal design, both over evolutionary time and over an organism's lifetime. And so we, we kind of poke this force length relationship into a lot of our understanding about muscle. We use it to think about basic kinematics. We use it uh, along with the force velocity relationship, which we think of as like the other like undergrad, what are muscle properties kind of. Uh, characteristic in hill type muscle models to predict movement to generate whole body simulations of movement so we really kind of use this force length relationship in our prediction of muscle and we use it to interpret evolution and form and function and the other side of that so it obviously has implications for how we think about organism movement the other side of that is that i really think it can inform our understanding of the mechanism of muscle contraction so we have this relationship that's very grounded in what we think of as the functional unit of muscle. So adherence to this force length relationship tells us that we understand muscle contraction. Deviation from this force length relationship tells us that we're missing some elements of our understanding in muscle contraction. So I like to think of it as having these multiple uses. We can use it to interpret performance and organismal morphology, and we can use it to understand the basic mechanisms of muscle contraction. I just want to shift gears a little bit now to thinking about muscle as a multi-scale tissue. So we have this force length relationship that's really grounded in our understanding of sarcomere structure. And this is down at a molecular cellular, subcellular kind of scale. So we have a force length relationship at the, at the molecular scale of muscle, basically. But if we think about muscle, muscle is this ridiculously multi-scale tissue whereby we have myosin heads that move a couple of nanometers and they move an organism's limb on the order of several centimeters. So we have this huge amplification of movement. And across that scale, we have these sarcomeres organized in series into myofibrils. We have those myofibrils packaged into muscle fibers or muscle cells. So we start to get sarcomeres both along the length of a fiber in series and also in adjacent myofibrils in parallel. And we then have bundles of fibers with associated connective tissues. And we organize these fibers with some geometry and some bigger scale connective tissues before connecting them to the skeleton or some kind of force transmission system. So the force length relationship we really think of as being grounded at the sarcomere level, but then we have this whole kind of cascade of effects up to organismal movement. And there's a few elements kind of structural and functional within this uh, hierarchical scale that I really want to think about because I think they start to explain some of the deviations in the force length relationship that we'll look at later. So to start with, if we just think about the thin actin and the thick myosin filaments, so one of the assumptions of the sliding filament theory and the basis of the force length relationship is that both of these filaments are completely rigid and that each cross bridge acts as an independent actuator. We know that's not true. We know that particularly the thin filament exhibits significant compliance and deforms under cross bridge load. Um, we know that there's interaction between cross bridges. So we have some kind of structural complexity even with the contractile protein filaments themselves. And if we then think about this, if you imagine this being a sarcomere cut across this axis, so we're looking at a muscle fiber in cross section, we have this complex lattice structure where actin and myosin have this kind of helical arrangement. So we have lots of potential for varying probability of cross bridge binding that isn't just set by this overlap. Maybe that's a hard limit, but it's certainly not the only factor that's influencing cross bridge binding. If we think about other aspects of, of muscle structure that 
might not fit with our force length relationship. Um, so muscle cells have this very complicated cytoskeletal structure. We have this complicated skeleton within the sarcomere, maybe the most notable which bit of which is Titan. Titan is this large spring-like protein that's thought to change configuration on muscle activation and so become a stiffer spring. So this is entirely separate from sliding filament theories which give us force length relationships. Oh, I lost a slide, apologies. Let me just tell you about it. Um, so, yeah. So if we think at uh, this kind of myofibril or muscle fiber scale, we have factors here, which sort of basically what we're doing now at this scale is we're superimposing a bunch of sarcomeric force length relationships in series and in parallel. So if I have a longer myofibril or a longer muscle fiber, I just stack force length relationships in series. If I add more sarcomeres, I can presumably do a larger length change of my muscle fiber while not doing such a big length change in each individual sarcomere. So maybe I'm less subject to force length effects. So if we look at the level of a muscle fiber, we're starting to look at multiple sarcomere force length relationships stacked in series. And then if we think at a bigger scale still, um, we have muscle pinnation angles. So we have muscle fibers organized with some geometry and we get this kind of complicated off-axis alignment of fibers so the muscles pulling in this direction but its fibers are organized at some pination angle so we have all of this structural complexity we have uh, compliance in the actin and myosin filaments we have sarcomeres being stacked in series and parallel and then we have those stacks of sarcomeres being organized at some angle to the line of action of the muscle and there's a bunch of other complexity in there but we'll um, there. all right so Let's think about this in terms of effects on the force length relationship. So if we think about those changes in cross bridge binding probability, that really changes what we might expect from the force length relationship. This um, old study from Tom Daniel back in the late 90s suggests basically cooperativity between cross bridges. So this is just a thin filament compliance against cross bridge compliance, basically showing a peak where you can get increased tension due to cross bridges interacting. So we're no longer adhering just to the force length relationship, but we're also talking about how cross bridges are affecting each other. We can have uh, force depression, so if a muscle shortens, before doing an isometric contraction, we get less force out. This has been attributed to changes in cross bridge binding probability and shows a deviation from the force length relationship. It's also maybe been attributed to Titan effects. And we can have force enhancement. So we can have higher forces after a muscle has been stretched than when it's contracting isometrically, then also attributed to Titan and a bunch of other potential mechanisms. We keep going up in scale. I talked a little about this previously, but if we stack different numbers of sarcomeres in series, while each sarcomere has the same force length relationship, if we look at these fibers individually, they're going to give us different force length relationships. If we then think about packaging those fibers into a whole muscle and setting some of the fibers at an angle, we get uh, different relationships between force and length. So. Basically what we're showing here is that as we move up these scales of muscle, um, we're no longer just seeing the sarcomeric force rela length relationship, we're seeing other layers of complexity added onto this and that's changing these force length relationships. Um, the last effect that might affect this, and I think is one of the ones that's been least considered maybe, is this effect of fiber rotation during contraction. So in these complex pennate muscles that have these angled fibers, we see the muscle fibers rotate during contraction. This changes the direction of the force vector and it gives us some muscle shortening without fiber or sarcomere shortening. And I have no idea what this does to the force length relationship, something fairly complex. All right, so we have all these factors that potentially build on sarcomeres to change the force length relationship that we see between the sarcomere and the force. All right, so let's move on to a little data um, and talk about some of these kind of structurally based deviations from what we would think of as being the classic force length relationship. So the first one I want to think about is muscle activation. 
So organisms vary their level of muscle activation as they move around. This is basically how they're changing their interaction with their environment. We see this here in uh, terms of EMG activity against flight speed in this cockatiel. We see the systematic change in muscle activity across its, across its speed range. And the organism can do this in two ways. It can do this by changing motor unit recruitment, so by activating different numbers of muscle fibers, or it can do this by changing the rate coding, which is the frequency of action potentials going to each muscle fibers. And this changes the amount of calcium within the fibers, it changes the amount of prostate vitamins. So we have these ways of modulating activation. The reason I want to talk about this is this was maybe one of the first deviations demonstrated in the force length relationship, whereby if we decrease muscle activation, we get this shift in the force length relationship. So at lower muscle activations, we have a longer optimum length. And so presumably at this point here, our sarcomere is slightly more stretched out than optimal overlap, but some other reason means that we're getting higher forces. And this has been attributed to a length dependence of calcium sensitivity. So this study is in a skinned fiber, putting a skinned fiber into different calcium concentrations and looking at how optimum length shifts. The theory being that at longer sarcomere lengths in low calcium environments, you're more likely to get calcium permitting cross bridge binding. Whereas at full calcium activation, you're no longer calcium limited and it's really just actin myosin overlap that uh, determines what happens. And so we can think of this as being eh, kind of a, a way of changing cross bridge binding probability at different lengths. We have different probabilities of cross bridge binding because of different calcium effects. But what I was what I was interested in when I first came across this literature was the extent to which calcium is solely responsible for this force length shift. Um, in, in all of these cases, calcium is confounded by the effect of force that muscle is producing, more calcium, more force. So it's very difficult to disentangle those two. And it seems like there could also be a, a more mechanical cause of this force length shift. So to investigate this, we took a frog uh, plantaris muscle, which is basically my go-to muscle prep, and we instrumented it with sonar micrometry crystals to measure the length of the muscle, and we activated the net the nerve across the nerve cuff. We activated this muscle maximally, so we activated all motor units with a high firing frequency and characterized some force length relationship. We then changed stimulation frequency by just sending a single action potential to do a twitch contraction, and we characterized the force length relationship under those conditions. So in this case, the muscle is producing low force. It also has low calcium because we are turning down the rate coding, and we see the shift that's been seen previously. What we did differently in this experiment is we also changed motor unit recruitment. So in this middle condition, we're activating just a few motor units, but we're activating all of those motor units maximally. So each of these active fibers has a high calcium concentration, but not all fibers are active, so total muscle force is still low. And what we see is still this rightward shift. So even in a high calcium condition, we still see this shift in the force length relationship which tells us that there's a significant effect of muscle activation level or how much force the muscle is producing that can be independent of calcium concentration. Not to say there isn't a length dependence of calcium sensitivity, but that there is certainly something else happening as well. This is pretty consistent. We've seen this across a couple of models. So this is the same data showing uh, those motor unit recruitment conditions in a cane toad. And what I wanted to know was whether compliance in the muscle, so whether a series tendon with the muscle could contribute to this force length shift. And the reason I was interested in this, we sort of did this experiment in this frog plantaris muscle, really as a, a kind of exploratory, could that, be a, could that be a factor? Is there something other than calcium? And this muscle has this huge tendon and aponeurosis, so it has a lot of series compliance. And so we wanted to know whether this was having any effect on the force length relationship. So what will happen when a muscle like this one in series with something compliant activates is that it will shorten and stretch the tendon. If I hold both ends of that muscle tendon unit constant, the muscle fibers will shorten against the compliance. And 
the amount that it shortens depends on the degree to which I activate my muscle. So we've kind of got this other factor that's also changing with activation level. And so in order to investigate this, we took the same data set previously, where we're measuring the muscle fiber length when it's in the whole muscle, and we're looking at the force length relationship under high and low activation conditions, and we see this shift. What we then did was take a fiber bundle out of the same muscle, so exact same muscle from a different frog, um, and we did the same experiment with just the muscle fibers, so no series compliance, so there's none of that shortening and kind of contractile history involved. And what we see then is we see still a shift in the force length relationship, and I'm attributing this to that length dependence of calcium sensitivity, but we see a much smaller shift, the x axis here are the same, so instead of a 30-40% shift, we've maybe got a 5% shift, which suggests that there is some role of compliance or the muscle fibers shortening upon activation on this shift in the force length relationship. So to, to test this more explicitly, um, we took a different frog muscle, this time the sartorius, which is a proximal limb muscle and has pretty much no serious compliance. It has no external tendon. It has no aponeurosis. And we faked an external tendon by suturing it to a piece of TheraBand. Uh, my poor grad student, Brian, was, thought this was kind of bizarre to start with. But we've now got this situation where we can manipulate the amount of compliance. And so we can have the same muscle in a condition where it's attached to fixed points at either end, and we have muscle and series compliance. Or we can introduce a clamp in between these and so basically exclude that compliance from our measurement system and measure the force length relationship in the same muscle with and without compliance. And so if we look at what just the muscle fibers are doing during a contraction with no compliance, the muscle fibers obviously stay at a constant length and they generate some amount of force. Uh, with series compliance, we see significant muscle fiber shortening as it generates force. So these muscle fibers are shortening in this direction, like this. And so we, in this experiment, got about 20% shortening. So we're looking at fairly large magnitudes of shortening. But the previous experiment with the frog plantaris, shortening was more like 40%. That muscle is incredibly compliant. And what we also see is changes in the force length relationship. So we see a big drop in the force a muscle can produce after shortening against this tendon. We attribute this to force depression that I talked about earlier, but it's a huge drop. And this seems pretty consistent in frog muscle, which is kind of interesting. So we see a significant effect of compliance on the force. We also see a significant effect on optimum length. So we see a shift in optimum length to shorter lengths when we have the muscle fibers shortening. Um, this data set's been going on forever, and it's, I've moved labs way too many times while trying to collect this data. Um, I'd really like a little more data that had better descending limbs. We have a lot that only reach a plateau, and so it would be nice to characterize the descending limbs. So hopefully this will be on its way to publication shortly, but it's taking a while. So we see a shift in optimum length with compliance, which is sort of what we predicted from the previous experiments. And it's not completely clear why this would happen. I just want to talk about this theory that's been kicking around for a while. It's been used to explain force depression previously. I'd like to kind of expand it here to try and explain this shift in the force length relationship. And it's to do with changing the binding of cross bridges due to compliance in the thin filament. So basically what this theory says is if you take actin and myosin, you have some degree of overlap at rest you activate the muscle with no tendon, the muscle just generates force where it is, you stay within the same overlap zone and cross bridges now just bind and generate some force. If you do this under a shortening condition where you have series compliance, you start with some amount of overlap and as the muscle starts to generate force, it's going to deform this actin filament. It's particularly going to deform the actin filament in regions where there isn't any cross bridges bound to stabilize it. So you get deformation of the actin as the contraction starts. As the muscle fiber then shortens, you come into this new region of overlap, but this actin has kind of been pre-stretched by cross bridges generating force. And so the theory is that you change and reduce cross bridge binding probability in this new overlap region, 
which explains both a decrease in force and also a shift in where optimum length is going to be found because all of this overlap, which is what determines our force length relationship, is not equal. Some of it has less binding probability. Okay, so a quick, quick summary from, from that quick section. All of this mostly is published if you want to go and take a closer look at it. But basically the, the suggestion is that, um, yes, there is a shift in the force length relationship with activation, but it doesn't appear to be wholly calcium dependent. There's certainly some effect of calcium, but the compliance seems to mediate this effect. So if you're looking at a muscle where you're changing activation level, but you have series compliance, the muscle fibers are gonna shorten to varying degrees. And this gives you this kind of compliance based effect on the force length relationship. And that's potentially due to changing cross bridge binding probability in this new region of overlap. And so this tells us something about mechanism. It tells us that, yeah, I mean, it suggests something about mechanism might be a, a better phrase than it tells us something about mechanism, but it suggests that maybe this compliance in the thin filament and cross bridge binding probability is responsible for that force depression and that shift. To my mind, it's somewhat as so the conflicting suggestions of does changes in tightness stiffness modulate force depression? Does changes in cross bridge binding probability modulate force depression? I can't think of a good mechanism by which uh, changes in tighten on activation cause this effect. So to me, this deviation from the force length relationship tells us something about the importance of stretch in the thin filament and cross bridge binding probability. And if nothing else, it gives us another kind of data point to work with in like, what is our mechanism of muscle contraction and what's determining force production. So this shift in the force length relationship tells us something about mechanisms of contraction and basic physiology. It also gives us some kind of pause for thought in using, um, using the force length relationship under maximally activated, totally isometric conditions with no series compliance, using this relationship to interpret and predict uh, muscle force during movement. It also maybe tells us that we've you know, got something slightly wrong about how we interpret organismal design. Um, I think what's particularly interesting from a, a kind of more clinical biomechanics or more applied biomechanics is that we use this force length relationship in our Hill models, which are the basis of force prediction. And under varying locomotor conditions with series compliance in muscles at varying activation levels, we see pretty poor agreement between the predicted Hill model here in red and the measured forces in black. This is Sabrina Lee in goats running uphill, I think. So maybe some of these dynamic effects of the force length relationship are skewing our predictions of muscle force. Right. So that was our, our dynamic section. I want to just talk for the last couple of minutes about some more comparative aspects of the force length relationship. So we, we said vertebrates use striated muscle for all of these functions, and that we had a pretty comparable system in invertebrates. And my shift to invertebrates, apart from thinking they're kind of cool and they just have so much more diversity compared to vertebrates, um, is that I got a HFSP grant to look at um, the mechanics and energetics of leaf cutters as dominant herbivores. You can see some leaf cutters down here destroying a pile of leaves. Um, and so the I'm really not going to talk about the basic premise of the grant. It's to try and develop a from first principle mechanics of cutting and muscle energetics uh, framework to predict task distribution in cutting, but we'll leave that for another day. What I'm interested in it for the purpose of this talk is they have these neat jaw closer muscles. So if mostly what you do is cut leaves, it turns out that your entire head is basically filled with jaw closer muscle fibers in all directions. So with a pinnation angle of like 45 degrees, it's essentially just a ball of muscle connected to a, a fairly complex tendon that connects to the jaw. So my motivation for, for kind of shifting to, towards invertebrates was getting this grant, but we're, we're having a lot of fun playing with some of the diversity in muscle that we see in invertebrates, but don't see invertebrates. And one of the major differences and what we're sort of focusing on at the moment is variation in actin and myosin filament length. So vertebrates 
are very consistent in actin and myosin length. And yes, there is some variation, particularly in the thin filament, but compared to invertebrates, like close to zero variation, invertebrates show a really wide range of thick and thin filament lengths. And this graph is from a, a beautiful data paper, but also kind of meta-analysis by Shimamura, um, showing thick filament length and thin filament length in a bunch of different species. So we can see like all of the vertebrates are basically clustered down in this bottom end. And then we have a, a spread with some variation up to crustacean claws of basically the longest thick and thin filaments. And so from a, a perspective of someone who's interested in the force length relationship, this is really interesting to me because it sort of provides a test of the force length relationship. If the amount of force a muscle can produce is due to the overlap between actin and myosin, if I have longer filaments and a greater overlap, I should get more force. And we largely see that. So this is a review from Taylor looking at uh, peak muscle stress versus resting sarcomere length, which we can think of as being determined by the thick and thin filament length. And we see this pretty linear increase in muscle stress with resting sarcomere length, which tells us to some extent that the force length relationship is doing a good job of predicting isometric muscles function. I, and I sort of got interested in when we're thinking about these leaf cutter ants also vary sarcomere length. They have a bimodal distribution of sarcomere lengths that are all longer than vertebrate sarcomeres. But what are the consequences of doing this? One of, the, one of the effects that we don't have to think about in vertebrates, so previously I gave an example where I showed different numbers of sarcomeres in series in short and long fibers. In an invertebrate, in the same length fiber, we can have a different number of sarcomeres in series based on the resting length of their sarcomere. And so one of the trade-offs of this increase in force in long sarcomeres is thought to be a decrease in contraction velocities. This is a just such a beautiful comparative muscle physiology paper by Bill Keir and Nancy Curtin, looked at uh, squid muscle fiber shortening velocities in the tentacles, which do rapid prey capture, and in the arms, which are sort of slowly manipulating things. And these muscles have really different resting sarcomere lengths. So the tentacles have really short sarcomeres. Their thick filament is about 0.8 micrometers, um, which puts them way down here, shorter than vertebrates. And their arm muscles have relatively long sarcomeres with the thick filaments being seven and a half micrometers. So that puts them somewhere up here. And we see these really big differences in shortening velocity, largely because of the number of sarcomeres stacked in series in a fiber. If we have many sarcomeres in series, each one does a relatively small length change for a given fiber length change, and so isn't very subject to force velocity effects, and so we can get much faster shortening and much higher forces. And so there's a lot of neat evidence suggesting basically this is how invertebrates modulate fiber types, and they have stereotype fiber types much like vertebrates do, but they modulate sarcomere length instead of myosin isoform. But this kind of got me thinking, okay, so we have this variation in sarcomere length, we know it affects velocity. What does this do to the force length relationship? And what does it do to the force length relationship at multiple scales? And I was interested in this because for the purposes of this grant, we wanted to do some modeling on the effects of this really complex muscle morphology. And I realized that I couldn't even guess at predicting a force length relationship for a fiber with different sarcomere lengths. So, if we go back to our, our multi-scale force length relationship idea, and we said invertebrates, you know, we can have fibers of different lengths, they have the same sarcomere, but they're going to have different force length relationships because of different numbers of sarcomeres in series. If we think about invertebrates, we have the situation where we can have different numbers of sarcomeres in series. And if we think about the effects or like the drivers of the force length relationship, if the force length relationship is being driven by the overlap between actin and myosin, if we have longer actin or longer myosin or both, we'll presumably get a different force length relationship at the level of the sarcomere in uh, fibers with different resting sarcomere lengths. And then if we apply a length change to the whole fiber, each one of these sarcomeres moves around a different portion of a different force length relationship. And I can't predict what the force fiber length, uh, what the force length relationship at the level of the fiber is going to be for those different muscle fibers. 
So my postdoc Nihav has started doing a little bit of modeling on this because this is something that we should be able to predict from sarcomere geometry. And so he's taking these thick and thin filament lengths. He's applying um, the kind of geometric changes that we see at each of these sarcomere lengths and predicting force length relationships. In this case, for this is the frog sartorius in red, the cockroach femur in green, and the lobster claw in blue. So just based on knowing these filament lengths and the basic mechanisms of what's causing these turning points in the force length relationship, he's predicting uh, sarcomere force length relationships and predicting basically the width of the force length relationship at 50% of maximum force, which is sort of a decent estimate of like, how far can you move this sarcomere in vivo before you ex experience large drops in force? And so if we plot the width of the force length relationship at 50% of force against resting sarcomere length, so we could think of this as being analogous to thick filament length, we see this kind of steady increase where we have much wider uh, force length relationships in longer sarcomeres as we'd expect. What's kind of interesting is if we normalize these to resting sarcomere lengths, um, this is actin length against myosin length color coded by that width. And if we look at the color coding kind of carefully, we sort of see that it's all over the place. And what that tells me is we have really different shaped force length relationships, depending on the precise relationship between actin and myosin, which is really an axis of variation that I've never considered before, but I'm sort of interested to poke around in it. We basically finished these this week. So think of this more as like what we are doing rather than firm results, but I think it's an interesting thing to play with. The next level of this would be to say, okay, if we took a muscle fiber with these different resting sarcomere lengths and we imposed a length change on the fiber, how far around the force length curve of how many sarcomeres would I move? And so what would my force length relationship of a fiber look like? And we can kind of take that as a null model almost, like if we take the sliding filament theory as our base of muscle contraction and we predict fiber force length relationships for different sarcomere lengths, we should be able to predict um, this normalized force against normalized fiber length relationship. And so this is just, excuse the many data points, I'll pull a few out in a second. This is just a bunch of normalized force fiber length relationships from a lot of different organisms. And so what I think will be really interesting to do is take these predictions based on contractile protein geometry up to the fiber length and look at how well adhered those two are. Because we see some really interesting things like this green trace is a bullfrog uh, plantaris muscle. This blue trace is a carp jaw closer muscle, both vertebrates, same sarcomere length, really different force length relationships. Uh, this red curve on the left is the very short sarcomere squid tentacle muscle we looked at before. The one on the right is a uh, crayfish abdominal muscle with a sarcomere length of like 10 micrometers, very similar force length relationships. And then we see some weird ones like some of the mollusks that exhibit catch having very stretched out force length relationships. We have invertebrate flight muscle having a very narrow force length relationship. So I sort of think this gives us a good way of predicting what we should see from just actin and myosin overlap and comparing that to what we actually see as kind of this. Um, yeah, what else is contributing to how much force a muscle can produce at a given length? And this kind of breadth of variation that we see across invertebrates gives us a much bigger scope for looking at those changes. So just to finish up, um, we've talked about some dynamic aspects of the force length relationship and how it's not necessarily adhered to under dynamic conditions, such as changing activation and with series compliance. This maybe tells us something new about the mechanism of muscle contraction, and it kind of gives us pause for thought in how uh, much we apply isometric force length relationships to our understanding of muscle under dynamic conditions. And then we talked about some comparative aspects of this relationship in invertebrates with different sarcomere lengths and using this as a a null model to explore deviation, even in just the isometric force length relationship across species. So how much does sarcomere length determine properties? And so with that, I'd just like to thank all of you for having me. Um, all of these people, so co-authors on a lot of this work, Manny, Brian, David, Mattia, and Nihav, um, Kisa Nishikawa and Dave Williams, who always have great insightful things to say and did a lot of work on 
compliance in the force length relationship with me and then Victoria, Ian and Carmela who were undergrads who helped out with a lot of the compliance force length relationship work. And with that, I'll be happy to take any questions or chat more. Thanks so much for that excellent talk, Dr. Holt. Would you like me um, to stop sharing or should we keep slides up? Yeah, if you'd be willing to stop sharing, that would be great. And then for everyone in the audience, if you're comfortable, I would encourage you to turn your video on to allow us to have a nice um, discussion. Um, the floor is now open for questions. If you would like to ask a question, you can use the raise hand feature in Zoom, which can be found under reactions on the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you're unable to ask a question, you can also type your question in the chat and I will read it aloud. Um, with that, I'll, um, Art, do you want to ask your question first? Sure. Hi, Natalie. Uh, I was I was interested in in the plot you showed of the dynamic case where uh, where you showed the shift in the force length curve, mm -hmm. and I was just wondering uh, if you plotted the that against the fascicle length or or whether fascicle length is available, whether whether uh, that exp whether everything kind of lines up or whether there's still a, a shift. Uh, so that is fascicle length. Oh, okay. if, you if you plot it against muscle tendon unit length, there is much less shift. They almost perfectly line up. So this kind of gives us a sense that maybe the length at which you turn the muscle on is like almost as important as the length you end up at. So like based on cross bridge theory, we would say that uh, the history doesn't matter when you get to isometry at that final post shortening against the tendon length length there should dictate force. I sort of have a suspicion that actually the length at which you activated your muscle is maybe more important because yes, like you say, muscle tendon unit is quite similar. Uh -huh. Well, I, I think one lesson I'm taking away from this is that, you know, we, we often say that the force length curve for a whole muscle mm -hmm. or, or really just the torque angle curve for mm -hmm. a, a joint is explained by the sarcomere force length curve, but I, I think it's, it's you know, basically you're, there are a billion things in between and it's sort of just luck that that the curves still have that some some sort of hump shape, but, um, but uh, yeah, too it, many it, things it, I think to, to say that the, you just scale the force length curve of the sarcomere and then you have the, what, the behavior of the joint. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think to, to me, it's been interesting to think, and especially moving into invertebrates, I think has given me a broader spread of understanding this, but thinking about a sarcomere force length relationship, a fiber force length relationship, a muscle tendon unit force length relationship, and a joint torque angle force length relationship, they all have one, but they're not totally mapped onto one another. You know, there's some causal relationship between them, but it's not a neat mapping. And I think um, so like the, the old Rack and Westby paper showing the initial shift was in cat soleus muscle that has a big tendon, but at that time we didn't know tendons were compliant. We were just measuring the whole muscle tendon unit and showing a shift with the muscle tendon unit. So we see force length relationships in all these places, but to what extent they're modulated by intermediate scales is uh, interesting mechanistically, I think. Uh -huh. And then also I was wondering, um... So I don't really know what, what people have been doing in this area, but you know, just, just the question of what's happening uh, with the actin myosin overlap as, a, as an explanation for the, um, you know, the limit when, when muscles are short. Uh, mm -hmm. are, are there sort of new fancy techniques like the molecular motor people are, you know, they're, they're making their own molecules and things. And so if they, mm -hmm. if they wanna lengthen something, they can just, uh, make that happen. So I'm wondering, is is there any stuff going on to to get at the mechanism more? Yeah, I'm. So I feel like, and I I peek into biophysics, then I come back and think about, you know, then I go back and look at what they're doing. Um, so the last sort of interesting things I saw were things like Titan binding to actin. Um, there's a lot of work out of Ken Campbell at University of Washington. There's a lot of cooperative binding. Um, but a lot of modeling work rather than experimental. And my sense is that we can like, you know, we can plate myosin and we can walk actin over it. And that tells us a lot about myosin as a motor 
but my my sense of where we really get stuck is when we come to geometry problems so when we're talking about the correct sarcomere geometry and making molecular scale measurements that seems to be like the sticking point to my mind and so I really want to know what's happening, what's actually happening. Like we can take a guess at what's happening on the ascending side of the force length relationship and we can say, okay, we know the myosin filament is this long, it must be being compressed. That can't be good for force production, but I would love to be corrected on this, but I don't think we have good biophysical measurements to know that that's actually what's happening. Um, so I don't know the right answer to that question, but keeping things in the correct geometry and making some of these biophysics measurements is kind of what I would like to see. Yeah, well, um, for someone who's living basically at the whole body level, I would really <laughs> like this to be built on more than than the current house of cards. So yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you'll be able to, to sort that out for us. So yeah, thanks. <laughs> Give it a try. Karen, would you like to ask a question? Sure. Um, hi. Uh, so I was also wondering about this um, dynamic uh, contractions. So am I? Is the interpretation that so you you mentioned that compliance influences the force length curve, but is this the same as saying that force depression after shortening influences the force length curve? It's just the, you're, yeah. you're saying the same thing. So compliance says. Uh, in that sense, nothing to do with it? Or is there also something um, special about compliance dependent? Um, so we're sort of picking through this data at the moment. Um, the reason I'm saying compliance is because that's how we did it. And because we're not imposing the length change, there's some variation in magnitude and velocity of shortening against the series compliance. And I haven't yet in my own head conclusively ruled out that there isn't some variation in those parameters that's contributing to that shift. But yes, I certainly think that saying force depression contributes to a shift in optimum length is, is a reasonably safe bet. Yeah, so then I was wondering, you may have done this experiment, but I was thinking of an experiment, which is to measure first the compliant case and then impose the same length change of the fibers on a non-compliant case and then mm -hmm. see if you observe the same effect. Did you do that or not? Not yet, but it is on the list of things to do <laughs> with yeah, a new cool. lab setup. Um, one of the, so I would really like to, um, I can sort of see a case like we know force depression varies across the force length relationship anyway. And so there's sort of a, a potential for just like, well, if you get more force depression here, that drops you from close to optimum length to nowhere near. If you get less force depression here, you stay in a better place and that shifts the whole curve. But because we were doing these measurements against compliance, which has some benefits, but it means that we don't have uniform shot. So I think doing a apply, like doing more like a force depression style experiment at a range of different lengths and looking at new optimum length and looking at the amount of force drop between conditions, I think would be really really helpful. It's on the list. Right. Cool. Okay. We just got a, a new postdoc that's going to finish this up, hopefully. So. Sure. Yeah. Tim, please go ahead. Hey, Nally. Uh, great talk. Thank you. Um, so I was also interested in this dynamic um, contractions. Um, so if I recall correctly, force depression is um, influenced by the force with the idea that that causes the deformation. Um, and then I would assume that there would be more force depression for a maximal activation than for a submaximal activation. Mm -hmm. And then I would think that the force for say, if you have a 10% activation, mm -hmm. that would actually not be 10% of the force. Is that indeed what you see? Um, so the way we're scaling activation is by isometric force. So we can't totally pass between the shortening depression and activation contributions of a drop in force. Um, the way the two intersect to me is that with a, in a muscle with a tendon in a fixed end contraction, if you activate the muscle, you get very little shortening. So you have very little shortening history. So you presumably get less force depression, although we can't actually pass that, but you get a difference in the change in overlap of those contractile proteins. So if we're saying deforming actin and trying to generate print form cross bridges in that new overlap zone, 
is not great for crossbreed binding, you don't see so much of that at the low activation conditions. Um, but passing the force contributions from just changing activation and changing force depression is not totally possible in our current system. Okay. Well, yeah, I think there's several ways where you, where you can do that. For example, EMG, uh, or mm -hmm. even controlling the amount of calcium, where you can just fix that at say 10% of the maximal, mm -hmm. and then try to see if the force uh, decreases. Well, the force difference is is sort of linear with the with the activation. Yeah. So changing um, changing activation in a more real sense rather than just changing the force produced would certainly be a, a way of getting around that. We we just have a we're just setting up a skin fiber system, so I'm hoping to be able to do some more calcium manipulations than we have done in the past because the the changing stimulation frequency is nice for like keeping a muscle relatively intact and having a kind of realistic system, but it, it, yeah, it doesn't let us get at actual activation, only force out in response to activation. Okay, cool. Okay. I actually have an idea for an experiment as well. Um, so for example, what you could try to do in vivo is if you have uh, a knee joint contraction um say you could increase the knee angle so that it compensates for the um the, the serious elasticity and then you can keep the um the fascicles isometric mm -hmm. you can compare the force you can you can produce with say a mm -hmm. a task that's isometric at the joint level where you do have mm -hmm. the the shortening and then i think the idea would be that you get actually more force in the first case right mm -hmm. yeah we've talked about doing this in a muscle tendon unit with a kind of dynamic controller so you stretch the whole muscle tendon unit as the fibers try and shorten and you try and keep them isometric um, also to do the reverse like what happens to the force length relationship when you stretch the muscle fiber um, but yeah i think i think trying to pass between these pieces is is important for understanding mechanism yeah okay great talk thanks eric please go ahead Thanks. Uh, thank you, Natalie. I love your graphics that you show. Um, I think that they're fantastic. So on the goat walking slide with the hill type mm -hmm. model, mm -hmm. you had said that there was poor agreement between the model and the actual measured. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's actually several contractions there that like were matched up super, super well, mm -hmm. right? They were like right on top of each other. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is missing in the model that allows you to predict across, say, these different activations? Is there like some stochastic aspect missing or is, or what would you think? Um, so one of my least favorite things about the Hill Muscle Model is that it is, it seems very differently wrong under different contractile conditions. And being systematically differently wrong is kind of worse than just being wrong, no, because then you get spurious results. Uh, there's a great paper out of Tom Sandercock's group looking at uh, predictions of a hill type muscle model compared to just an isolated muscle uh, in situ, I think, doing an isometric contraction. And the fit of the model goes down as you change muscle activation level. So the hill type muscle model is built on a force length and a force velocity relationship determined in maximally activated muscle. Organisms almost never maximally activate their muscle. And so you get, and if performance of the muscle is nonlinear with activation level, you get differences in your goodness of fit. Um, it's also very sensitive to length change. So we know that like nothing that goes into the hill type muscle model has any contractile history it doesn't have any force depression it doesn't have any force enhancement it doesn't have any of these shifts in ups and length um so really we whatever bit of the mechanism we're missing is what's missing <laughs> from that from that model um length change and activation and the intersection of those two things certainly have huge effects on force that aren't captured in that so um if you look at Monica Daly has a great data set looking at guinea fowl falling in holes, things that are perturbed and you experience rapid length changes and rapid changes in activation, your model just falls off a cliff. So like the more dynamic a condition becomes, the worse the fit becomes, I sort of think is why you're seeing that different degrees of agreement. Um, as to what we should add, I would love to know because then we would have fixed the how does muscle contract <laughs> problem, um, which would be great. Um, but certainly including something that can capture history dependence I think is really important whether we whether we just include history dependence as a term or whether we try and put in a titan based model or a change in cross bridge affinity components of the model I don't know but 
it would be nice if it was mechanistic because otherwise we just keep you know sticking parameters on the model which is not ideal thank you i i have a question natalie um do we know why sarcomeres have a gap at the center line that gives us that small plateau region of the force length curve? Um, so my best guess, not a biophysicist, I keep getting further and further into the molecular scale stuff. And I'm like, I really started as an organismal biologist. I swear, I don't know how I ended up down here at the scale. Um, so myosin monomers are like a head and a tail. And you have this bipolar filament, so the tails stick together and the heads stick out. And so the space where there are no cross bridges is basically the length of the tail of two myosin monomers. And then you kind of spiral around, so you have cross bridges all the way around. So it's basically the two butts stuck together is the is the gap. Um, we've been kind of curious. This model that Nihav has uh, requires you to know the distance that that is because it's the distance of that absolute plateau you have this like shallower slope but you have a clear plateau um and from what we've kind of just doing kind of review of the literature it seems pretty consistent across species and muscles and people that have measured that zone which makes me think the myosin monomer is at least structurally pretty consistent at that scale and so you see a, a fairly consistent gap between those things that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, Walter, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, first of all, th thanks, Natalie, for coming. And uh, sorry, I, I was about 10 minutes late. We, no we had various emergency meetings because of COVID problems in Alberta and the yeah. university doesn't 100% uh, know what to do. And so, <laughs> yeah. so, so, so I actually thought I would miss the whole, uh, the whole seminar. Maybe I can make a a couple of comments to, to questions that were made. And the first one, like uh, from great. Art, about the ascending limb mm -hmm. and why force might be decreasing. Uh, and another factor that I think uh, was not mentioned is that uh, uh, Riedel and Taylor and Fabiato and Fabiato did some nice experiments in the 1970s where they showed that uh, with very short sarcomere lengths, activation was not full mm -hmm. in intact mm -hmm. fascicles. And when they added when they added um, zinc in the one case, Riedel and Taylor and, and caffeine in Fabiato and Fabiato to get a higher um, um, exposed, yeah, well, a higher release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic mm -hmm. reticulum, then the decrease in force and the ascending limb was actually much less. So that there might be, there might be an activation component there. Uh, there's, a, there's a paper in the 60s and I was all doing kind of the same thing, but with very large shortenings rather than at short length talking about inhibition of, of calcium release, I think. So I, I like this idea of overlaying activation problems on the kind of geometry problem in the way that we think of the force length relationship. Yeah, no, I, th I think that, that that's a possibility. And somehow when you artificially resurrect that calcium release, then, mm -hmm. then much of the force seems to be recovered. And then the other thing is, you know, when you have individual myofibrils and you go to very short sarcomere lengths, uh, you know, 1.6, 1.8 or 2 microns, then for rabbit sores, for example, they go back to about 2.3. So there seems to be clearly mm -hmm. a restoring force there. They don't stay at 1.6 or 1.8 or, or 2.0. Uh, but I'm not sure if anybody has ever measured that restoring force and, mm -hmm. and what that might be. You would attribute uh, that to compression of myosin? Well, probably? you know, it seems to happen as well when we are at 2.0, you know, where, where, where okay, you think so, that the myosin uh -huh. is not really compressed anymore. Uh, Hank Gronzier suggested at one point that maybe maybe Titan might also have a pushing uh, possibility rather than only a tensile possibility. Mm -hmm. But there, there appears to be something there where, you know, that restores the sarcomere lengths to uh, much longer than the mm -hmm. 1.7 or 8 that you would expect mm -hmm. if it was just the myosin. And, and to Tim's, Tim's question, um, the activation dependence, uh, we and other people have shown that uh, in fatigue or when you give less calcium in a skin fiber or when you add um, inhibitors like uh, butanidin monoxime, then it seems that uh, force depression effects get actually bigger um, mm -hmm. with lesser activation. Uh -huh. And uh, so, so and, and I, I think mm -hmm. part of the reason is because then you start dividing by a very small resting force. Mm -hmm. So when I say it's smaller, I mean in a relative sense, relative to the corresponding submaximal mm -hmm. Um, isometric force, not not in absolute sense, not in absolute sense. And that's interesting because if it was a 
if it was a defamation of actin type uh, mechanism, you would expect you would yep. expect the forced depression to go down. Yeah, exactly. With lower I actually, force. I actually wanted to ask you a little bit about that because you know you mentioned actin filament and myosin filament compliance on a couple of occasions and being significant. I always think about it. You know, we measure and other people have measured 0.2 to 0.5 percent. You know, so I always think this hundred nanometer actin filament becomes, uh, sorry, this thousand nanometer filament becomes 1002 or 1005 mm -hmm. nanometers. And, uh, you know, I, I, I have a little bit difficulty believing in that theory, uh, although mm -hmm. we have said it as well <laughs> in the past. So, so, so I'm guilty as well. But the more I think about it, I, I would hear, like to hear your opinion on it because it seems, you know, relatively small deformations. And I, I'd be really surprised if that would have, you know, a 20 or 30% force decrease in effect just because mm -hmm. you stretch something by 0.2 percent and mm -hmm. what, what do you think yeah. about that um so i i think i use significant sloppily there so um the paper by tom roberts that's kind of looked at like multi-scale compliance and energy storage possibilities now across um across scales of muscle and he's very pro tendon and so i think there's a difference between saying something is so compliant that you can stretch it and absorb a significant amount of energy in it and release that versus something is compliant enough that you can deform it that the precise alignment that you needed to have is lost or improved and i think those are two two quite different ways in which stretching a thing can have an effect yeah, and yeah. The, the magnitude of stretch required to have that effect varies between the two things um i'm especially with looking at the invertebrate muscle now, I'm increasingly curious about this kind of alignment. So the um, invertebrate lattice structure also varies a lot. So you get very different numbers of actin around a myosin yeah. and you have different pictures of the myosin helix and alignment between those things is not always obvious to, to me as to how they line up particularly well. So I think understanding um, the kind of range over which cross bridge binding is likely, you know, on an actin binding site versus a myosin head, like how likely are you to get binding and how easily can you disrupt that? I think is the key question in understanding whether actin deformation is sufficient to, to change cross bridge binding probability. And, and going to the invertebrate uh, muscles, I think is a, is a nice idea also because it has different structural proteins, you know, and some of the mm -hmm. invertebrates don't really have a a proper titan so 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 we are, we are starting to do a little bit in that direction as yeah well. it's uh you suddenly have this huge range of variation that you can look at <laughs> yeah the, the, the one question you know the one result that i didn't understand and i wondered if you um uh you know can give me your explanation for it is um uh, you're in the frog plantaris when you showed the shift to the right with mm -hmm. the decreased frequency and it makes a lot of sense to me that that happens when you activate all motor units at the, mm -hmm. at the lower frequency. But how, how do you explain the result that you get the same shift with a full activation of just a few motor units, but they're mm -hmm. all fully activated? How, how, that, that was a real surprise to me. I hadn't seen that. <laughs> it, was, it was a real surprise to me as well. Um, so this is why we then moved to the the kind of compliance based theory. So by taking the same fibers out of the frog plantaris muscle, but excluding all of the aponeurosis and tendon, um, you don't see such a big shift. You see that very small shift that is kind of characteristic of what people have measured previously. So my perception is that in the frog plantaris with associated tendon, at the high activation levels, the fibers really shorten a long way. And so you're actually shifting the fully activated curve to the left and the lower activations are staying to the right because they're not shortening so yeah, much. Yeah. Um, so I think you're, when you're looking at activation, you're actually looking at varying degrees of shortening against a compliant tendon, and that's what's giving you the shift. And because the compliance is so high in that system, the I think if we did it in a much stiffer system, we'd see like a bigger shift in the low calcium conditions compared to the high calcium but low force okay. conditions. Um, but I think in that one, everything is just washed out because 40% shortening is, yeah, yeah, is huge. Yeah. And so that becomes yeah, the dominant yeah, effect. Yeah, I thought it was really interesting, yeah. And the other, the other thing that I um, understand, but, but the magnitude of it surprised me is the enormous uh, 
residual force depression that you get mm -hmm. in your preparation there. Uh -huh. you have, 50 percent. <laughs> and, and, and even and, and it's mostly towards the ascending limb, their plateau and ascending limb, mm -hmm. where we usually see Let's... I know I, I know in Catsoleus I, I saw five percent, you know, uh, in mm -hmm. that region and, and you see fifty percent. Uh, any mm -hmm. any explanation there about no, what so happened? The first few times we did these experiments, we had the no something something is up, and I was talking to a friend who's also been doing uh, doing a similar experiment in bullfrogs for different reasons, seeing the same magnitude of shortening depression, which makes me curious about the kind of frog mammal comparison. Although a lot of yeah, the early yeah. force depression force enhancement was in a neuron rather than mammalian muscle, but I think a, I think a direct comparison in the same system between frog and mammal muscle would be interesting. There, I think there's some interesting comparative approaches to the kind of force enhancement, force depression problem, like mammals, frogs, invertebrates with different height, and do we have the same yeah. characteristics of force depression? We know we see it in all of those cases, but I don't think we have a controlled enough case to, to be able to pick it out. But 40, 50% is huge, especially and, in a muscle that it's designed for producing huge amounts of work seems like a Terrible and and on the and on the ascending limb, you know, yeah. I mean that 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 uh, just was really freaky. Yeah, yeah. and <laughs> it, it's it's possible that we're um, looking at larger magnitudes of shortening because it does have this hugely compliant tendon and variable shortening velocity. So it's a, it's sort of a fundamentally different comparison than pushing the muscle through a standardized length change, letting it shorten against its own yeah, tendon. Yeah. But it, but still, it's, it's still it's, it's still, still way it's, out there. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, great. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Walter. Keenan, would you like to ask your question? Sure, yeah, just a comment on uh, the difference between mammalian or amphibian muscles. I did a really, really similar experiment to the one you described when you added mm -hmm. the TheraBand. So we just added um, like a small piece of silicone tubing mm -hmm. um, and uh, altered activation levels um, and compliance that way. And we didn't find any um, we use rat medial gastric EMS and, and we didn't find any change in optimal length, um, despite seeing, um, a lot of forced depression. Um, but just to, to comment on, on your initial, um, figures showing just kind of those points on the ascending limb. So it took us a, a few experiments to kind of try and find like the, um, the right amount of compliance to use to get a full force length curve. Cause mm -hmm. I had a, a number of experiments where I, I used a piece that was way too compliant and I only mm -hmm. got shortening to that ascending limb, mm -hmm. but, but I wasn't confident that that would provide like a reasonable estimate of the optimal length. How, much, fit how like much shortening did you ultimately cl closer get? To, closer to like 10%. Okay, and what was, 12, 12%. The, what was the shortening in the non-compliant static condition? Because you have some yeah, so, so, in the muscle there. Yeah, so, so the non-compliant was like 10%. The, the, with the added compliance was like 12, close to 15%, okay. if I recall correctly. Um, and so 20% more shortening, and it did decrease the force output a fair bit, um, mm -hmm. but the optimal length didn't change. And then the other thing that we tried to do was, was match the... Um, non-compliant force output to the compliant force output mm -hmm. and so the force output was almost identical but mm -hmm. the the compliant condition shortened way way more and so pre presumably had way more uh, force depression mm -hmm. um, and still didn't see any change in optimal, mm -hmm. optimal length and so one of the things that i kind of guessed with that was like you talked about you know all, all, also with just um, manipulating compliance on its own mm -hmm you're going to have different degrees of shortening magnitude through that length. And so because it's been shown that, you know, the magnitude of force suppression can be dependent on the length, mm -hmm. I, I kind of assumed that um, if there was like this length dependent increase in force depression, it might be kind of negated by this length dependent decrease in short shortening magnitude that we were seeing. So it kind of like canceled each other out so that we got this decrease in force, but no change in length. But that was kind of the guess. But. Yeah, yeah. So I think maybe one of the reasons we do see at least a preliminary shift, like we have a, a good number of repeats looking very similar with very little descending length, um, is that we're doing basically zero shortening to 20% shortening. So right. we have a much bigger gap. And it seems like the magnitude of the shift is pretty proportional to the shortening. Um, and we're seeing like a 15% shift in optimum length. So it's slightly off. So it wouldn't surprise me if your perturbation is only giving you 5% difference mm -hmm. in shortening. Um, 
that you might see something with a bigger perturbation. It might be that fucking right. weird. We, we, we can't answer yeah. that question. Um, and I, I'm curious about your like inability to get a descending limb with more compliance, because that's basically what we're seeing. We're like stretching it really far and we get a nice plateau, but very little descending limb. And if you look at some of the, um, so some of those force length curves I showed at the end that were just from like a bunch of different species, things that are more compliant seem to have a much broader curve and muscles that we know to be stiffer have a much narrower curve, even with like very similar actin myosin properties. So I'm, I sort of have the suspicion that some interaction of compliance and shortening and shortening depression is leveling out that force length curve, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting. So I think one of the things the comparative thing will let us get at is like predictions with no compliance and then reality. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm curious to see, but yeah, I'm, it's interesting that with less compliance, with more compliance, you didn't get a descending limb because we have a postdoc fighting that same battle at yeah. the moment. <laughs> so yeah, we'll so yeah, we, we were just trying to just like, you know, slice the, the tube a little bit shorter, whatever, to mm -hmm. be a little yeah. bit more, less compliant. Yeah, we definitely get a good, a spot, a good and but... consistent leveling off, but not being able to get a descending limb seems kind of mechanistically important because we assumed there was one previously prior to letting it shorten more. So, um, so yeah, I think that's a, an interesting, like the width of the force length curve with contractile history is kind of an open question. Yeah, thank you. Are there any final questions for Dr. Holt? All right, um, with that, um, well, thank you again, Dr. Holt for your great presentation. And I really enjoyed the question and answer period as well. And thanks everyone for signing on. Next week's HPL seminar um, will be given by Dr. Salvatore Federico, and he will be presenting on biomechanists by chance and adventure in continuum biomechanics. Um, so thank you again, Dr. Holt, and I hope to see everyone again next week. Thank you, everyone.